with last year's release and criminally fast cancelling of First Kill, a show with a wonderfully queer central love story which gave us a Romeo and Juliet dynamic between a lesbian vampire and her human lover, I started to feel nostalgic for a certain little web series about a broody gay vampire and her tiny gay love interest and the way it captured the internet, in particular the LGBTQ community with its amazing representation, engaging storylines, hilarious dialogue, and charming main characters, who brought a lesbian relationship between a vampire and a human to life in a funny, sweet, and genuinely entertaining way. The Carmilla web series was based on the novella of the same name, first published in 1872 and written by author J. Sheridan Lafanu. The original novella was a gothic horror story in which the titular vampire preys on the innocent protagonist Laura. Originally used as a cautionary tale about the sins of lesbianism, the novella is unfortunately openly homophobic and the evil seductress vampire is vanquished in the end, with innocent protagonist Laura escaping Carmilla's evil lesbian clutches. The web series reimagined the gothic novella as a modern day coming of age love story told from the point of view of freshman journalist student Laura Hollis, played by Canadian actress Elise Bauman. Laura was equal parts adorable, intelligent, righteous, and determined. When her roommate is one of the many girls who go missing from her college campus, Laura goes on a quest to find the truth and the missing girls. She is somewhat hindered in this quest when she begins to fall for her new vampire roommate, who may or may not be responsible for said missing girls. Yeah, but we know she's a vampire. I mean, we've known that since the blood in the milk container, right? Vampire, 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 yeah? The series started as a small, single camera web blog and attracted such a huge and loyal audience that it ran for three more seasons and ended up with a feature length film and an official novelization of the series. It struck chords with young women everywhere especially those in the LGBTQ community who were drawn to the frank, female-driven queerness of the series and the positive ways in which it was portrayed. Like many stories about female vampires pursuing female humans, the original Carmilla story was that of a predator stalking her prey. The lore of the novella is repulsed by Carmilla's romantic and sexual advances. Carmilla drinks from Laura without her consent and is revealed to have been stalking Laura since she was a child. The novel is very much erotic horror, but it is still horror, and Laura is horrified by Carmilla's nature, both vampiric and sexual. Laura in the modern web series is a lesbian, and this fact is made clear from the beginning, with no fanfare, no angsty coming out, no frills and no bells. Do you remember what I said to you when you told me you were a lesbian? Thank God you finally said it. She is surrounded by a cast of characters who are mostly queer, not to mention the fact that the writers, directors, and the cast themselves are made up of many members of the LGBTQ community. As such, the topic of queerness and the sexual and gender identities of the characters are treated as normal, and the series exists in an endearingly open world where these characters are allowed to express such things freely and without negative consequence. Laura and Carmilla's relationship is also updated from its homophobic novella roots, and the ship, or Holstein as it is referred to in the fandom, is the main component of the series which has kept audiences returning. Instead of Carmilla being a predatory figure who corrupts pure innocent Laura, both women are attracted to one another, and Carmilla's vampiric nature is revealed early, giving the two a more honest foundation upon which to build their relationship. The series had all the fun of exploring human vampire dynamics and tropes while telling a compelling and subversive love story between two women. And this love story is filmed and framed in a way which stops the audience from sexualizing the two women and, by extension, their sexualities. The characters are attractive in their own ways through their individual styles and attitudes, but it never feels like the series is reducing them to only their sexuality nor do their physical interactions feel exploitative. Watching the series feels safe, it feels comforting, and for many queer viewers, it feels relatable and without cringe. While the queer component of the series is no doubt a huge part of its success, representation alone cannot drive a series. 
Carmilla would not be the amazing web series it was without its fun storylines, sharp dialogue, and amazingly written characters. And those characters start with the adorable and tiny Laura Irene Hollis. Laura is a great subversion of the hero slash chosen one archetype. Far from being a perfect heroine who triumphs and saves the day, she is a flawed and very human young woman who sometimes treads the line between hero and anti-hero and often makes things worse by not thinking her actions through. Her methods are ruthless and at times morally questionable, and a big part of her character arc involves her recognizing this about herself. Her black and white viewpoint causes her to be judgmental and unwilling to compromise, which makes it difficult for her to adjust her moral viewpoint to accommodate those around her, especially her love interest, whose vampiric nature is a point of contention for Laura. Carmilla herself is not overly concerned with said nature, and through this, the series hilariously subverts the tortured vampire archetype. Vampire? Oh, how exciting. May I join you on your lonely quest for redemption? Not if you want to keep your teeth. In a great twist on the usual vampire turns good for their human trope, Carmilla refuses to bend to Laura's black and white morality, especially when asked to betray close connections of her own. Carmilla isn't bothered with making herself better for Laura or anyone, and through this, Laura is forced to give up her romantic notions and face the reality of dating a vampire. Eventually, both girls must learn how to grow and evolve without the other, which they do in the wake of their breakup and various betrayals over the second season, and the audience is treated to two compelling character arcs, which intertwine and eventually bring the two back together. While Laura learns to slow down, not judge, see the grey in the world, and do good for the sake of doing good, not for self-righteousness or guilt, Carmilla gives up her apathetic ways and learns to care about others outside of Laura, letting go of her codependency on Laura and facing up to her abusive vampire mother. Both characters are allowed to be flawed and layered while remaining likeable and relatable. The two main characters are surrounded by a strong cast, and while there were initially some issues with the initial lack of and then problematic treatment of characters of colour, these characters were, for the most part, rich, endearing, and lots of fun. From Laura's overprotective and righteous first love interest Danny, to LaFontaine, the resident biomajor, to token straight guy Kirsch, who subverted every basic expectation put upon him. Yes! I'm in the friend zone. What? I have made it into the friend zone. Are you, are you happy about this? <laughs> of course I am. I mean, yeah, I totally want more because, you know, you're super smart and way tough and smoking hot, but, you know, I get it. You're just not into me that way. These supporting characters were entertaining, dynamic, and endearing, and each had their own arcs, which were executed to varying success. Outside of the Holstein ship, there were many dynamics and friendships to enjoy. From the adorable borderline romantic friendship between Flor Don Perry and her best friend LaFontaine, to the subversive friendship between warring frat bro and sorority sister Danny and Kirsch. Audiences fell in love with these characters and dynamics, along with the main characters and ship, and all worked together to create a memorable cast of characters. The series was set up as a murder slash kidnap mystery, and the disappearance of Laura's roommate kickstarts the whole plot. A fun and engaging mystery follows, in which the characters get to show off their various skills and passions. While this initial mystery is wrapped up in the first season, enough threads are left to pick up in season two, and what was initially a small little mystery about missing girls unfolds into a fairly epic tale, involving magic, vampires, giant fish monsters, and even gods. While the series mythology does somewhat get away from itself at times, particularly during the overpacked season two, the overall storyline comes to a satisfying conclusion and leans heavily on the Holstein relationship and the strength of the two leads love to make everything work out. While everything within the series helped to draw in and keep audiences, it was perhaps the extras provided by the cast and crew which truly cemented the deep relationship and bond between the fandom and the show. While the series aired, Tumblr and Twitter accounts were made and maintained for all the main characters, providing extra insights into said characters and giving the audience a glimpse into events we only got to briefly hear about due to the weblog format. 
these accounts remained active and were continuously updated throughout the following three seasons of the show. And she still hasn't followed me back on Twitter. Additionally, the cast provided dozens upon dozens of extras, from in-character videos to behind-the-scenes tidbits to dramatic readings of the original novella. The cast began to appear at various conventions and always seemed happy to interact with their fans. Over time, Elise Bauman and Natasha Negevanlis became fixtures at Klexicon, a convention for queer women celebrating women love women ships. The entire cast formed an extremely close bond with their fans, whom they affectionately nicknamed Cream Puffs, after a nickname used in the show, and when the producers and stars asked for donations for a Kickstarter to fund a feature film, the Cream Puffs responded eagerly. The fact that this tiny web series grew from a single camera web blog into a big enough pop culture phenomenon that it ended up with a feature film is no small feat and really speaks to the quality of the show produced, the dedication of the cast and the impact it had on its audiences. The producers and writers took the opportunity granted to them and turned the feature film into a loose adaptation of the original gothic horror novella complete with fantastic period flashbacks and a spooky haunted house, all while continuing the established storyline and characterization from the web series. Set five years after the final battle of the web series, Laura and Carmilla are pulled back into the world of the supernatural when Carmilla's tragic past literally comes back to haunt them. The team behind the camera take full advantage of having the freedom of a film set and we get everything the web series was unable to give us from a sprawling gothic mansion, to glimpses into Carmilla's horrific past, to Carmilla finally getting fangs and properly biting Laura. We were also finally introduced to Carmilla's ex-lover Elle, a character many had wanted to appear since she was first mentioned in season one, brought to life by Canadian actress Dominique Provost Chalkley, who was best known for her role on Winona Earp. The film felt like a love letter to the Cream Puffs, and was made available for purchase online in packages which of course came with a plethora of behind the scenes content. A post credit scene left the door ajar for a sequel, but it seemed that the series had finally run its course. Although the cast and crew do still occasionally pop up on the original channel, such as when Nat Negevanlis and Elise Bauman appeared during the height of the pandemic to read the novella out loud. Carmilla was a game changer in many respects. It showed what web series could achieve with smart and engaging writing and how staying engaged with the fandom can be a big plus. It was somewhat revolutionary in its portrayal of queer characters and the ease with which it placed these characters within the narrative and didn't make their queerness an issue. Many LGBTQ fans have spoken out about how the series helped them to come out and the cast has continuously shown its support of the community. Revisiting the series is like seeing an old friend again, and if the team behind and in front of the camera ever decided to revisit it themselves, I am confident that the Cream Puffs would eagerly return for more.